Good morning, afternoon, and hello. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to our webinar, Effective Nonprofit Labor Relations. Uh, my name is Max Smith. I'm the uh, Communications Director for 501C Services. Uh, we are a 100% employee-owned company that provides alternatives to state-run unemployment insurance programs. We provide services to more than 1,500 nonprofits nationally. Uh, we administer the 501c Agencies Trust, which offers a comprehensive suite of risk management services and multiple stop-loss protection solutions for 501c3 nonprofits. We also administer UInsure, which is a first-dollar unemployment insurance program, not only for nonprofits, but government entities and tribally-owned businesses as well. Many of you all joining us today are already working with us, and we thank you very much for doing so. I have a bit of housekeeping before I turn our program over to David. Um, first of all, if you have any questions, David's going to be taking questions throughout today, so you should feel free to shoot us a question at any time, and I will compile them and gently interrupt David as he goes to uh, cover your questions, and then, of course, we'll take questions at the end. If you need a copy of today's materials, uh, first of all, they will be emailed to you later today, along with a video recording of the program. But the materials are also available in your GoToWebinar window as a handout. You can download them now. <clears throat> if you just go to Handouts, click the Down button, and uh, click on the link, it should download the PDF of David's program will download to you now. For recertification credits, uh, we're offering HRCI, SHRM, and CAE today. There will be a post-event poll that will pop up as soon as we're done. Uh, you need to complete that poll for me and indicate what you need from me, whether you need HRCI, SHRM, or CAE, and then I will send you those within 24 hours. And finally, uh, as you all, most of you all know, we do this uh, program once a month. Uh, next month, we have the top 10 nonprofit risk and insurance pitfalls. Uh, our speaker will be Scott Conrad of Hub Insurance, so we will hope you'll join us for that. There'll be a link in that later today if you want to go ahead and sign up for it on Thursday the 13th and not Friday the 13th, so we avoided that. But um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce um, our speaker today, uh, David Ridoff. He's the uh, president and CEO of Modern Management and an employee relations consultant. For those of you who don't know, Modern Management is an HR consulting firm located in Grays Lake, Illinois. That's uh, kind of right between Milwaukee and Chicago. David's actually in Chicago with us today. Uh, Modern Management specializes in employee relations, management, and organizational development, as well as employee surveys. Uh, a couple of David's accomplishments include developing processes for responding to employee morale issues uh, and implementing communication plans for organization, organizations in transition. And I'm going to go ahead and hand the program over to Mr. David. Thank you, Matt. Take it away. So I've sent Thanks. it to you. You can go ahead and share your screen. Very good. Show my screen. Is it showing? And we're seeing it. Go right ahead. Very good. Very good. Thanks, Mac. I appreciate your time and your help in all this. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone, well, depending on what area of the country you're in. A uh, couple of introductory comments just about how I got into this business and why I'm in this business, and I think it sets the stage for what I want to talk and share with you guys over the next hour or so. I'll say you guys because I am from Chicago. I'm speaking from downtown Chicago. Um, I first got interested in employee labor relations and engagement uh, during a, a college job. My father had referred me to Argonne National Laboratories, Peaceful Atomic Nuclear Energy, nuclear energy, and uh, uh, I would make from 5 p.m. to 1 a.m. I would be asked to make copies, uh, these big, great big blueprint copies, and I would do it through the night, and they would leave a stack for me because the machines were busy during the day, and they would leave a stack, and it was it was a unionized environment, and I would make. Each night I'd make the stack and I'd be finished within two hours. So I'd send a note to the supervisor saying, double that stack. And I was done within about five hours. And I sent another note, double that stack again, because I'm trying to impress my father and his contact and that I'd gotten this job and 
and all that. And the next night I got a visit from the from the shop steward saying that's uh that's too much work you're putting through that and you stay and remain with this one stack and and I just didn't understand how that all happened and I thought there's got to be a better way to do these things and encourage productivity and encourage engagement and encourage support so many of the not for profits that non non profit organizations y'all work for are so mission driven and you can't forget that many people who join your organizations are part of that mission and believe in that so much. And so I focused you know, from that point in college, I started focusing in on what is it that drives employees and how can we help employees get more engaged through our leadership. So today for the for the hour, I'm hoping that you'll walk away from this hour thinking and rethinking your leadership style with your organization, um, developing your supervisors and managers and inspiring you to give you some ideas on things that you can do with managers that can increase the engagement of employees and at the same time, either if you're unionized, make it less relevant, or if you're not union, uh, encourage that employees don't seek third-party representation. There's a lot of influences going on right now today. Um, when we look at w how employees make decisions, they base their decisions on who they trust, uh, who to best represent their interests, who offers the best hope, and who best relates to them with dignity and respect. I was in, so encouraged by a study that I saw from Cousins and Posner that asked across the country, what is it that you expect from a manager or supervisor and it really came down to four things they they want their manager to be honest competent forward thinking and inspirational and i consistently find oftentimes that uh people generally try to be honest they, there's they, that doesn't isn't typically a problem most folks are competent in their position that's not always true but hopefully true they're forward thinking, they're looking at what's down the road, but oftentimes we forget about the fact that people need to feel inspired and they need that from their leadership. And so I focus in on that hope piece quite a bit as well. Trust is built by familiarity and dignity and respect is just common courtesies and, and treating people with respect uh, the way you would want to be treated in those ways. The influences that are going on these days that are that are tremendous, that make it even more difficult to manage. We're at one of the lowest unemployment times uh, in our history. And couple that with the push for higher wages when you realize there's the fight for 15 out there and marches in cities across the country that we face, rising healthcare costs all make the concept of employment just more difficult for everyone and there's great competition for employees so so many organizations have to be focused not just on recruiting but trying to retain people so that you're not spending the dollars to try and recruit relying upon some of your mission driven organizations is great and i think that's all part of the employment but it's not the only thing that can engage employees and i think when we look at some of the the, this period of time where there's great competition for employees and we look at some of the labor numbers and we when, we, when I talk about unions and I'm only going to spend a couple of minutes on it in this upfront part but it does set the stage because there's enormous amounts of union drives across the country who are trying to engage the disenfranchised engage the ones who are not happy now there's a reason for it and if we look at the actual numbers it's at an all-time low. So unions are truly desperate for numbers. If 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 their income comes from employee dues, they're at their lowest in history. They're now down to to, to a, a a mere um, I'd say 10.7 the deal. But really, if you look at private sector, you take public sector out of that, you're going to see that it's at 6.5 percent. So if you take teachers and postal employees and policemen and firemen and all those people out the average for private sector is at 6.5 percent so that's down a lot but the real story comes in the next two pages with some of the data where we see the election success rate 
the unions are creeping up in their success quite a bit with 71.1% in 2017. That isn't the whole story. If we look at the next slide where it talks about where they're most successful, it becomes even more interesting. And if you compare, if you look at finance, services, healthcare, so many of those um, uh, covering nonprofit organizations, that's where they're most successful. 86% successful in finance, 77% successful in services, and 76 in healthcare. Truthfully, being in this business for 30 years, I would have predicted and reversed this list. I would have put the bottom on the top and the top on the bottom. This is so counterintuitive to me as I look at this. And then I had to step back and say, okay, now why? Why is it this way? And one of the things that helped me understand the ordering of this was that I saw an AFL-CIO study of themselves asking why they win or lose elections. And one of the interesting facts out of it came that they asked questions like, should we go after people who are older or younger? And they found out that age didn't matter. You could be 65 or 25, they had the same likelihood to unionize. And then they asked the question, should we go after people who are more educated or less educated? And I would have predicted less educated, but in fact, there's no correlation. You can be PhD prepared or high school educated, you have the same likelihood to want a union in your workplace. Then they asked gender, and here they found a correlation. They found that women are more pro-union than men. Whereas I think the truth of the matter isn't necessarily that it's gender related. I, if I look at these success rates, I think that that's, there's an effect here going on because the businesses that are voting for unions more often, those three industries down at the bottom of that list, we see that in fact, most of those people are women in those industries. You walk into a hospital, it's 80% women, only 20% men. So I'm not so sure that women are more pro-union, although some might say because of the issues they face of equal pay and glass ceiling, that in fact, maybe they are more pro-union. It may be the, simply the effect that there's more women in the industries that unions are targeting these days. But, and, and I have to tell you, the, the unions are very happy to be able to report that women are more pro-union because women are the fastest growing part of the workforce in this country. And the, the idea of diversity in the workforce, workforce is huge to the extent that we've really got to start thinking about our leadership style because so much of the leadership text and the training is based on, on uh, I think, in the 50s, and I'll talk about some of those studies in a little bit, which was all kind of male-related. And in fact, the diverse workforce we face um, encourages managers to start thinking more about what is it that motivates others, not necessarily what is it that motivates them personally. But nonetheless, the real money question on this afl cio study came out when they said, should we go after people who know us and love us or never heard of us before? And what they found out is when they went after groups of people where over 50% had been in a union before, their success rate dropped 30 percentage points. And that started to help me understand that, wait a minute, the industries that are least saturated with unions tend to choose it more often now versus the industries who've experienced unionization, construction, manufacturing, wholesale, retail, those all tend to choose it less. And it became very clear to me, and, and as I kind of go through this journey of what do people find important for engagement, it became very very clear to me that it's, it's, it's that relationship with the supervisor, that if that's gone awry, they're going to more likely choose a union that they need representation and that, in fact, if they've actually been in a union, they know it doesn't make the difference in all those arenas that they'd like it to, but they need to experience that before they're able to have that knowledge. Couple all this with the recent Supreme Court Janus decision, Mark Janus, who challenged the idea of being compelled to pay dues in public sector and the Supreme Court ruled that in fact they they that they should not be compelled to pay dues as part of their employment so effectively in all non right to work states 
unions potentially could lose huge amounts of income because recently it's been ruled by the Supreme Court that they can withdraw from paying those dues. So there's now an, a, a, a much greater push by unions to get out there to make up for what they predict are going to be great losses they're going to face. This particular study that I've just shown on the screen right now, I think is one that really underpins everything I want to talk about going forward, and that is the the importance of the supervisor or the manager. When we look at employees' preferred source of information, and they were given all kinds of choices, group meeting, letter to the home, meeting with the top executive, uh, coworker, grapevine. It was fascinating to find out that 92% chose their first line supervisor as their most preferred source of information in an organization. And that is compelling because when they only choose 51% as a top executive and only 29% choose a union steward, and you look at some of the other data, 43% of employees in the workplace regard themselves as cynical. 83% believe rank the supervisor as the most believable, most credible source of information. 97% of CEOs believe their communication affects employees' job satisfaction. Now, some would find that a little humorous, and, and the, the truth of the matter is it's the supervisor that impacts that the most. But it's good that the CEO believes their communication affects that because they need to be in the game here. And 75% of CEOs believe their communication affects employees' job performance. But you know this to be true. You can have at any one of your not-profit, not-for-profit agencies, any one of your organizations, you can have some very charismatic leaders, people who are in it for the reasons and the mission that your organization has. And that can be very effective. And they can walk out any given day, hold a group meeting with your staff, for two hours, here's the vision, here's the future, here's where we're going. It'd be extremely compelling. Get employees all supportive and engaged to what the organization wants to accomplish. They can do that, they walk out of that room, and many will turn to their first line supervisor and say, what do you think? And in that next 20 seconds, what that supervisor says can make a difference as to whether that two-hour meeting with the CEO meant anything or not. And I, I use this study to make sure and remind ourselves that there has to be the alignment, that supervisors and managers are the key to making sure employees align with the organization's messages and understand where the executives are coming from. They're the translator to this. And it's extremely critical to understand that those supervisor and managers play that role and to develop them to be able to present that in the best, to present the organization in the best manner possible to encourage engagement by employees. Now, it's a difficult task because not all employees are engaged and the conduct of a supervisor, the actions of a supervisor are, are extremely important. Everything from they need to communicate with credibility. The, the study I referred to earlier, Kuzas and Posner, who had said that when they went across the country and interviewed people asking what's their most important thing they get from a manager uh, is that they're honest, competent, forward-thinking, and inspirational, and that was a great study. What made What was so compelling about their study was at the same time, Another study was being done where it was being asked, what is, what is it for you to, what makes you find someone credible, trustworthy or not? And in that study, they found that there were four characteristics that made a person trustworthy or credible. And it was amazingly the same four that Kuzas and Posner had found about what people expect from leadership, honest, competent, forward-thinking, inspirational. And it was kind of an aha moment for them to then step back and say, well, wait a minute, credibility is the key here, and trust, and trustworthiness. So it is extremely important to focus in on supervisors' credibility and development of trust. 
Steelcase did a study asking, do you trust management? 60% of America doesn't trust management. 60%. The numbers are terrible these days. But then when they changed the study and asked, and they put real people's names behind that, not just do you trust management, but they said, do you trust Judy? Do you trust Frank? Oh, yeah. Great manager. He's wonderful. Judy, she's fantastic. Do you trust management? No, don't trust management. And what you find out is that familiarity breeds that credibility and trust. So people can't manage from an office. They can't manage from a closed room. That if we're expecting our employees to feel engaged, we have to be familiar with them. They have to know us. They have to see us on a regular basis. Middle management and the other thing that I encourage everyone to do with their supervisors and managers is to recognize how hard that job is. Middle management is the toughest job in America. The two easiest jobs in any organization is the top and the bottom. You'd be the CEO. There's, <laughs> if there's any CEO on the phone here, they're going to deny this. But, you know, CEO says, you know, there's the hill, charge. And the first line employee says, just tell me what I got to do and give me a paycheck. But the middle management has both sides as bosses. It's their job to take the mission and vision and, and organization's objectives and communicate them to employees in such a clear, cogent, compelling manner. They actually support the organization equally. It's the job of the manager to take the hurdles and hassles and issues the employees have and communicate them to the executives in such a clear, cogent, compelling manner, they actually give you the resources you need to get the job done. It's kind of the Big Mac theory of management. These folks are the bun in the middle, and they're getting squeezed from both sides. So it's one thing to just say to employees, you know, I want you to be these things. You need to help them. You need to coach and counsel them as much to teach them how to coach and counsel employees. We're not investing in our managers and supervisors nearly enough. And in fact, we're reducing their ranks out of need for productivity and putting more dollars to the front line of workers. But the truth of the matter is, the better they are at presenting the organization, they can be working supervisors, but the better they are at resolving complaints, providing consistent standards. And that's not treating everybody the same. That simply means that standards are similar and they're giving recognition and reward to people for contributions and they're compassionate and concerned about employees welfare the more we can develop those things the more we're likelihood to uh to avoid any kind of intervention by a third party or certainly the more likely we're able to develop our supervisors and then engage our staff the, one of the things I wanted to mention, because later I'm going to show that it's the first step in the best problem solving, but and it's so simple, <laughs> and it's almost too obvious to even have this as part of the presentation, but coaching managers on how to listen to employees and hear what's coming back. You can, you can do surveys to the end of eternity. You can get feedback and do focus groups and everything, nothing replaces managers listening one-on-one -on -one from the employees as to what they're concerned about, what they're upset about. And there are various levels from not, not listening to true empathic listening. But the simple tips of, and I would encourage you to share these with employees, the very simple tips of reminding them that they're to focus on employees, give eye contact, turn their computer screen to the side, turn their phone off, set it down, um, paraphrase for people what they've said so that you're sure and ask clarifying questions. There's a whole display that encourages people to feel they've been listened to. And focusing in on that, I think, can increase the effectiveness of the managers. Nine out of 10 employees say they don't get clearly spelled out reasonable expectations. They don't have the tools or necessary uh, resources necessary to meet expectations. They don't get honest or accurate feedback. And 
They don't get a fair quid pro quo recognition and rewards exchange for their performance. But in fact, if we look at engagement and we start looking at not only is it nine out of 10, we can start to analyze across the country and there's plenty of studies and I'll show you two in a moment that talk about whether employees are engaged or not. Now, defi definition of engagement, the emotional commitment and connection of employees. But the truth of the matter is, you, you know, to define it fine, and you can use all these terms, you know for a fact when you walk into an organization, you can tell the employees that are engaged and the ones that aren't, um, just simply through their behavior and, and how they um, engage in things and whether they're passionate or in, uh, uh, motivated to even in, acknowledge you as you're walking by, for example. So, but the, the two big studies that I'm looking at here, one's Gallup Research and another Aon Consulting, they come out with pretty similar results that there's 33% actively engaged, 51% only present, and 16% and actively disengaged, 15% actively disengaged in the Aon study. When you think about the um, employees and you really look at, if I go into an organization, I often say there's three types. There's there's a percentage in every workforce. I don't care if you're at Chase Bank, General Motors, or MGM Resorts. You've got people who hate you, hate life, hate work. Uh, they're just cranky. There's nothing you do to change them. And I'm sure there's plenty here on the phone that are listening that are thinking and visualizing of those one or two in your workforce that are, are that way. And then fortunately, there's a larger percentage on the other side that think that are actively engaged. They're truly passionate about the business. And then you've got a bunch in the middle. The problem with the, the disengaged, the actively disengaged, they, these are folks that are truly attempting to, to undermine the organization sometimes. You really need to help them out. And, and I mean, help them out. They need to be out of the organization. You don't have time for those things. And it isn't so much even them. And I know it sounds rather draconian to say, you know, just move them out. But it's the impact they have on the others that cause such a problem. And they're trying to cause organization harm or, or are motivated. They're more motivated than present or passive employees, but they're motivated to cause harm. And the, they, they are actively trying to disengage others. And so it's really in, incumbent upon you. And the problem is we spend way too much time on those folks. And supervisors and managers attempt to change them. And if you've ever worked with some of these actively disengaged, the ones who are really out there, you'll notice they, there's no changing them. And the other thing that bothers me the most about the actively, they never leave. They stay with an organization for 20 years, and their job is to try and actively encourage others to be disengaged. So you need to get efficient with those folks. You need to move them out. You need to have good performance review process that helps the organization move them out of, the, out of there. There's differences among the present and actively disengaged. The present and passive employees are most, more dissatisfied with their relationship to supervisor, colleagues, being treated fairly. The actively disengaged are always dissatisfied without promotional opportunities or recognition of performance or communication from top managers or pay. The truth of the matter is nobody's investing in these folks because they're showing no investment in the organization. So it's a, it's a, spi it's a consistent spiral that only goes down. Resources spent on the ones above, the passive and the present employees, focused on, focusing on the supervisor and developing them, focusing on team building and organization, looking at consistency of treatment across organization regarding policies and providing them the resources. Those, all those activities have much more return on investment than trying to do anything with the actively disengaged other than get them out. Reasons it's important to focus on engagement is that there's clear direct relationship between engagement and things like employee turnover, greater customer satisfaction, increased profitability, better patient outcomes. In healthcare situations, it's directly real realized that where there's an engaged workforce, there's a higher 
a degree of better patient outcomes, higher productivity, and increased safety. When we look at, and I particularly like this next section that of slides I'm going to show you, because it's not just looking at the topics that relate to engagement, but it also shows you specifics about that, and then what um, what you might want to do to try and get better at these things. And there's eight different things that are that are part of the top engagement issues. Senior leadership being one of them. And there's no particular order to these, by the way. They're not from most to least. It's just these are eight things that relate to engagement. But people are more concerned today about what top managers are doing. And they're less satisfied with communication from the top. So when you're doing surveys or when you're doing town hall meetings or when you're doing, those are not just HR initiatives. You have to have operational and senior leadership involved and visible in those. Career advancement's another one that people are very concerned, especially millennials. And that, and that we should stress the importance of experience to get the patience we need for people, but they are truly concerned about investment. Upward communication, there's greater desire for a voice in decision making, that people's um, issues are heard, and that you not only do the survey, but you do the action plan to respond to that. Flexibility has become a big thing in the workplace these days, and we're, we're um, becoming more of a remote workforce. Many people, I mean, this call, for example, is one, you can take this call from anywhere, um, is a good example, but many organizations are getting more and more remote because their people want greater personal and professional life balance. But that also means then that coworker relations are falling where we have team building. Recognition and reward systems are important. One of the best books I've ever read out there is A Thousand and One Ways to um, Ideas on Recognizing and Rewarding Your Employees. And they're, they're not money related. They're very small things, but it's a great book. Um, there's greater burnout because where our productivity uh, expectations are huge, and that's especially in healthcare and education, the surveys are showing. And the relationships with colleagues are highly valued, but um, getting the feedback and getting the ability to team build is becoming lesser and lesser of a, of a focus as people expect greater productivity, and we don't take the time in the workforce to, to develop those relationships. And then of course, the relationship with the supervisor is the top determinant of satisfaction in an organization. Tony Robbins quote, to effectively communicate, we must realize we're all different in the way we perceive the world and use this understanding to guide our communication with others. I think it's also important to consider the fact that you should do unto others, not as you would do unto yourself, but as you would have others do unto you. Um, I'm not saying that correctly. The old golden rule, do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. Great leadership has you changing it slightly, that do unto others as they would have done unto themselves. Um, I'm realizing that more and more on communicating with millennials and finding that you don't call and you don't voicemail, but you text if you want to get to them. So I'm I'm realizing that if I call or leave a voicemail, I won't hear from them for days. But if I text, bing, the answer comes right back. And so I'm having to change how I communicate. At the same time, with a, a guy that works for me that's 65 years old, if I text him, he kind of takes that as an insult. You didn't have the time to call me. So I have to realize that my communication strategy has to change based on those people. On this slide that I have showing, there are difficult communicators in an organization. Recognizing them and helping a manager how to deal with them in an effective manner is important so that it doesn't just, so when we have those negative employees, we're not wasting a lot of time, that we're now really isolating them and not letting them burn up a lot of energy in the room. I think it's also important that we take a multiple communication vehicles and that teach managers that it's not just one way is a right way, that they have to think about their staff, think about who wants to have it face to face. Do we need to show a video? Is it verbal? Is it is it also is it via the email system that's gonna that's gonna be the way they prefer their messages. 
I like this quote as well by Earl Wilson Jones. It said, science has never come up with a better office communication system than a coffee break. And what that goes back to is the fact that it is important that we have face-to-face -face communication. I want to move ahead a few slides here. Um, the power of communication and not to be uh, afraid of difficult messages um, done properly and provided the right way to employees, you can actually increase the amount of respect and increase the amount of integrity and strengthen your credibility by delivering negative messages, but in a manner that is compassionate and recognizes the impact it's having on others. Encouraging uh, interaction between departments so you don't have silos and that your feedback should change with the type of performer you're talking to. And so that, again, I'm focused in on being as effective and as, as least time consuming with the marginal performer. And so you do corrective feedback, it's candid, it's constructive, but with a solid performance, it's more developmental. That takes more time. And the exceptional performer, it takes even more time. So you're doing reinforcing feedback. But feedback hints, that I would offer your supervisors and managers, this could almost be a handout for you to, to them, is addressing performance situations early um, and not necessarily, uh, uh, not just being candid, but being constructive. So you can be honest in it, but you also need to be constructive in the way you develop this in offering suggestions, offering ideas as to better ways to have behave through this. Differences between managers and leaders, I show this because you're really trying to move your supervisors from what is just a manager to an actual leader, where they don't just have employees, but they create a team among those employees. I think one of the hardest things on this list is applying equal treatment versus balancing the interests of, because it's very easy just to apply equal treatment. It's, you know, the sameness. But the truth of the matter is what you want to do is you want to treat a marginal performer differently than a, a spectacular performer. And people get accused of having favorites and in the workplace. And one of the things I encourage supervisors to do, yes, I have favorites. You, you want to be one? And I'm an equal opportunity favoriter. Anybody can be my favorite. Come to work on time, dress appropriately, get good feedback from our, our, our customers. Those are the things that make a person my favorite, not because our kids bowl together or something. So it is important to to um, help them understand the difference between just applying equal treatment and then balancing the interests of multiple types of those employees. The seven leadership skills that I think all need to be focused in on are communication skills, negotiation, motivation, change management, trust building, empowerment, and visionary. The truth matter is just supervisor needs to do something. They And I don't think you need to test managers a whole lot to see what they're deficient in. I think you generally, by knowing them, can pretty much predict that. I mean, you can do Myers-Briggs if you want, which is great. You can do disk profile. Uh, there's businesses out there that do a bird test. You're an eagle, a dove, an owl, or a peacock. It can be any of those things. But... Uh, and that's all fine, but truth of the matter is you talk to somebody and you know they're either good or bad at, at empowerment. They're either good or bad at negotiation or communication. But I think the key is not just analyzing, but having a, a supervisor pick what they want to work on and actually develop an action plan for themselves and where they actually either go out and read articles on that topic or or they... Uh, uh, interview another manager about that aspect in themselves or ask their employees what they need to do to get better at one of those seven leadership skills. I also wanted to mention uh, in this program the fact that we can focus in our messaging and make it more persuasive by following some classic persuasive techniques that we see in even just watching a television commercial. Um, I used to teach public speaking and communication down at University of Illinois years ago. And the most effective method of persuasion is testimonial. And so that oftentimes as a leader, 
as a supervisor, it's sometimes better to get them to look to the employee workforce and say, you were involved in this at some point, tell others how it went and get the employees encouraged to be give a testimonial to something. Very powerful when it comes from a coworker. Making sure that when they're in front of their staff, they have emotional appeal. In other words, it's game on every time they're in front of their staff. Steeping their message in high moral ground. It's right, it's fair, it's appropriate, it's ethical. Um, providing facts and figures, giving some data to your uh, uh, discussions. Making sure that what's important to the employee is brought up in the discussion so that it's relevant. The impact to the organization is important, but you also have to consider the impact to the employee. Inoculation is taking the negative things that they would know might happen and saying it for them. Say, I know you may be concerned about this. Getting endorsements from recognized sources that say this is a, a good process or good change. Bandwagon effect, everybody's doing it, you should too. Call to action, be specific about what you hope people do as you walk out of the meeting and create the enemy. Nothing is more powerful in binding people together but to say the enemy isn't us, the enemy is this over here. And that if we don't um, bring our costs down or respond to this customer demand better or in those sorts of things, we won't be able to deliver the services that we hope to do to the communities we serve. What I said earlier about listening, it's the number one item in responding to an employee complaint, that first you listen, um, second clarify. It, if you can get your supervisors or managers to follow this easy six step process in handling a person's concern, and it, it really, it, a difference of two or three minutes to do this, but where they listen, they actually clarify, ask questions, they show empathy or concern for it, validate that it's okay they have this concern. The biggest problem our managers, supervisors do that I've seen is that they go straight to four. They don't do one, two, or three. They immediately go straight, I'm sorry, straight to five, where they state their position. And in fact, if you do one, two, three, four first, you are much more likely to f have people get engaged. But oftentimes somebody will go to them with a problem and say, I'm upset about this. And the supervisor probably heard it 10 times that day. But if they immediately go to stating their position, yes, we're working on it this way, I've heard about it, others have said this, the person doesn't feel validated. They don't feel listened to. They don't feel anyone's concerned for them. And they don't think you're actually going to do anything about it that you've already got in your mind you're made up so instead if you ask them to do that fifth and then thank them for bringing the problem you're much more likely to encourage engagement among the staff employee participation programs i think are a good uh element we found that um going back to the union topic employees with are 14 to 20 percent less likely to vote for a union when there's been an employee participation program that unions only won in 16 percent of elections where there are employee participation programs so that's a direct i think relationship with the fact that employee participation programs are a very good thing having a complaint or dis dispute resolution program anything from open door to peer review even arbitration agreements, are they're now allowed again. The courts have said that they are okay. But a peer review system is wonderful for evaluating employees' performance and making everyone beyond reproach that, if, that any um, assessment of people's performance or problems can be related to that way uh, via peer review analysis. I think um, when we look at at uh, these dispute resolution problems. The AFL-CIO again did a study where there's a fair grievance procedure is a key issue. Unions um, win 69% of those elections where that's in a vulnerability and it's a strong vulnerability. But in other organizations, <coughs> there's legal benefits beyond union avoidance. There's less likelihood people are gonna sue you where they've gone through peer review. Now, peer review causes, it, it really does cause cultural change for an organization to be able to do that, but, uh, but 
the elements of those systems that I think that are, are good provide people that they have a fair hearing. You've got some trained panelists for this that are selected. I think in all ways, a good peer review system can really make an organization change in the way it treats employees and gives them dignity and respect. Well, I've hit my 45 minutes. I have one short little um, kind of moral of the day, and then I'll open up for questions. Um, I've over time, for a long time in intervening in organizations and consulting for them, I feel that there's it's really little things make a difference. And that our focus in on little things with employees can make such a difference. I never learned how much little things make a difference. I was going to consult for an organization in Key West. And if you've ever been to Key West, you can drive five, six hours from Miami on a two lane road until you hit Key West, or you can go to Fort Myers and take a 20 minute flight across the water and you're there. So I was only gonna be there for half a day, so I thought I'm gonna take that 20 minute flight. So I go up to the gate agent and the first time in 30 years of travel, I got asked as I walk up, they turn to me and they say, oh, glad you're here, Mr. Ruff. We're about to take your flight. A um, Couple questions, uh, how much do you weigh? I'm a little sensitive about that. If you see my picture, I'm a, a, I'd like to call bigger framed person. And so as she asked that of me, I lied. <laughs> I told her some weight that I thought was probably on my driver's license, which has been wrong for years. And so I lied. And then I sat down and she turns to me and she goes, oh, we need to weigh your briefcase. And my briefcase weighed all of 12 pounds. And I, and I lied way more than that. So I'm now sitting down waiting for the plane to go and I am sweating bullets. I'm thinking, why does it matter? My vanity, I was dishonest. I'm going to take the plane down. I'm going to, we are going to die with sharks eating us because I was stupid and vain. So I head bowed down, walk slowly up to the gate agent. And I say, um, uh, uh, ma'am, she goes, yes. I said, I, you, you know, the, the weight thing. <laughs> she goes, yes. I said, well, I lied. <laughs> and she said, you know what? I know, dear. And we went on and I made it across to Key West. What I tell that story about is just, it's, it's little things that make a difference. And I'd like to leave with you the one fact that if I make the difference, whether the plane, my weight makes a difference, whether the plane gets across the water or not, or my briefcase of 12 pounds makes a difference, you, you personally make the difference as to whether or not employees feel engaged, whether they feel part of the workforce, and whether or not they feel respected and dignified in the workplace. So I'd be happy to take any questions if they have any on this wonderful Tuesday. All right, we, have, we don't have any right now. I'm sure everybody was busily taking notes, so we'll give them a, a second to uh, perhaps shoot some over. Or maybe they're dying for lunch. But that would, I, you know, that's always a possibility. <laughs> I'm the only thing between them and their sandwich. Is <laughs> no question. And I'm not seeing any questions come in, sir. So I, I think, whoa, whoa. Uh, that was actually a question for me. <laughs> so, yes, this session is being, reco <laughs> session is being recorded. Um, everybody will get a copy of that recording an hour after we hang up. No worries. Leah says, great webinar, by the way. Great. Here we go. Um, on the front end, how can you question applicants about their engagement level? I like, for, for me, if I'm doing an interview of an employee and questioning engagement, I like to ask questions around how they solved problems in the workplace in the past. If they came across a lack of a resource, didn't have the equipment they needed, uh, didn't feel treated properly in the workplace. I like to ask them how they solve that problem. And that tells me whether they, well, whether they are engaged or not, because a person who's willing to the, you know, kind of step into the difficult problem of, well, I went to my, my boss or I, I, uh, I actually went to HR 
and asked them or I asked my trainer if they actually actively did things um, in response to problems they see in the work in the workplace that tells me that they're more engaged versus not so I always ask how they solved a problem okay. and that's the only real question we got everybody else is just saying good webinar so <laughs> great great I hope I hope it was fun for me to do it. I hope I didn't talk too fast, but I got through all the slides, so <laughs> I made it. All righty. Well, thank you, sir, and thank everybody for uh, uh, joining us. And uh, we'll, if you have any questions for David, please reach out to him, and um, the same for me. Have a great week, everybody. Thanks, Mac. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye.